Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium the sponsor of this session, Aaron Flott, North America Alternative Delivery Director from ACOM. Good afternoon. <clears throat> AECOM is pleased to be sponsoring this breakout session. We can do better, staying on top. Canada is recognized as a global leader in infrastructure and P3s, but we cannot fall into the trap of the status quo. This afternoon, we will see three presentations that focus on the diversity gap in the industry, the challenge of training job-ready graduates, and the need for more innovation in projects. Speaking for my firm, we view diversity and all the things that stem from it as lifeblood to our infrastructure sector, not just the P3 market. It's important to everything that we do. Our first presentation this afternoon, Closing the Diversity Gap, is presented by Dr. Matty Semiatiki, Associate Professor, Planning and Geography at University of Toronto, and Adriana Chang with Diamond Schmidt Architects. Matty Semiatiki, his work focuses on delivering large-scale infrastructure projects, public-private partnerships, and the effective inter integration of infrastructure into the fabric of cities. His recent studies explore the value for money of delivering mega-projects through P3s and the diversity gap in the industry uh, in infrastructure workforce. Uh, Dr. Simia Tiki is a frequent media commentator on urban planning and infrastructure-related topics and served on the board of directors of the public agency Waterfront Toronto. He earned a PhD in community and regional planning from the University of British Columbia. Adriana Chang is an infrastructure planning and construction enthusiast. She is one of the few female visible minorities managing institutional construction contracts at the, at the site level. Adriana was nominated for a project manager of the year in 2012 by a global nonprofit organization for her work in designing, implementing, and managing community empowerment projects in Toronto. In 2013, she led a team that won the Walmart Women's Economic Empowerment Award for a project that increased the standard of living and quality of life for low-income single mothers in Toronto. Adriana's graduate research on diversity in partnership with Dr. Simia Tiki chronicles the challenges that women face in senior leadership positions within the infrastructure industry. Uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Simia Tiki and Adriana Chang. And let me add one point here. We will have some Q&A. We're going to have three different presentations. Uh, so we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A between each one of the three presentations. And then there may be some time for questions afterwards as well. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Simia Tiki and Adriana Chang. <clears throat> Thank you, Aaron, and it's a wonderful pleasure to be uh, here with you today. Um, and I think quite uh, pertinent to be speaking in a session called uh, We Can Do Better. Uh, Adriana and I are going to be speaking about diversity in uh, the infrastructure industry broadly and the uh, public-private partnership industry in particular. Uh, and this is, as you'll see from our presentation, uh, we think an area where uh, the industry uh, has not kept pace and where there's uh, a clear opportunity uh, to do better. So, what we've seen over the last number of years is that many industries um, uh, have been facing questions about uh, diversity among their uh, ranks, both in uh, senior management and uh, frontline employees. And we've seen this. Um, we've seen this in journalism. We've seen this in science and technology. Um, we've seen this in high tech. Uh, we, we've seen this. Um, most recently in law uh, with uh, the really powerful article on the front page of the Globe and Mail uh, by Hadia Rodrigue uh, talking about uh, the lack of diversity in uh, the legal field here in uh, Toronto and its, and its impacts on uh, minorities who work in that field. Uh, and yet we haven't seen the same attention in the infrastructure industry. Uh, and Adriana and I uh, in our presentation are going to uh, try to provide some context for uh, the, the both uh, some stats on the level of diversity in this industry uh, and also then on uh, the lived experience of diversity. Now, as a, as a personal note, um, 
I come to this topic uh, from a position of privilege. Uh, as a white male, uh, I have not experienced um, barriers or challenges uh, because of my identity, um, and so, and I think it's 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 important to recognize that. Um, and uh, there are people in this room who have been uh, fighting this uh, fight for a long time. And there's also a win uh, women uh, in infrastructure who have been uh, working at this for uh, for a very long time. And so I want to acknowledge uh, their efforts, uh, and I want to provide this uh, the the evidence, the data uh, as as a tool that others can use uh, to advocate. Uh, uh, for uh, greater diversity in this industry and to speak about uh, what the value is and why we should be pushing for it, both because it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the morally correct thing to do, but I think also because it's, it's going to be advantageous uh, for, for this industry. So why, uh, why does diversity matter? And in the academic world, there's been a lot of research trying to understand uh, the various uh, uh, rationales and, and uh, impacts of having a diverse uh, workforce. So uh, to scroll through these uh, very quickly, uh, one is a representative bureaucracy, that when uh, the administration, and especially senior administration of organizations, reflects uh, um, the demographics and the face of the community, uh, the the decisions are often seen as more legitimate uh, and often match uh, the community needs. Um, there's, an, uh, there's a stream of research on the value of diversity, uh, which shows that organizations with greater diversity uh, tend to have better uh, performance in terms of financial performance, in terms of uh, uh, share uh, performance, in terms of uh, the management of risk. Now, one of the key findings in this research area is that uh, if diversity doesn't reach the level, uh, it, do it doesn't exceed uh, what's conceived of as tokenism, which is often pegged at around 22 to 25 percent of your senior executive team, you can actually get worse performance uh, because diverse views are not uh, seen uh, and listened to and people don't feel comfortable uh, voicing their opinions. So there is a value of diversity, but we need to have, uh, but it needs to be at a significant level. Then uh, we have gendered management styles, and uh, there, this is around uh, uh, not male and female, or men and women, but masculine and feminine. Uh, and there's a view that uh, male leadership tends to be hierarchical, top-down, authoritative, uh, whereas uh, uh, feminine uh, leadership style tends to value uh, mutuality, reciprocity, collaborative sense-making, networks of information and power sharing. Kind of the key features of partnerships. Uh, so there might be a value in having uh, a, a broader uh, set of perspectives and a broader management style uh, at the top of uh, the organizations that are, are, are leaders in this, uh, in this industry. Uh, then there's diversity in the talent pool. This industry is uh, in a constant battle for talent with many other fields uh, that are uh, interest, uh, of interest to uh, 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 young people entering uh, the workforce. Uh, and so uh, to, in order to attract, if we're only playing from uh, uh, for example, only uh, if men are the predominant uh, group in this industry, we're only playing from half the workforce. Uh, and that can be problematic in terms of getting the best and brightest who will then deliver the projects as well as possible. Uh, and finally, leadership and diversity as agents of change. Uh, that what we find is that when organizations have diverse uh, leadership at the top, that filters down to the, to the um, organization below and uh, um, uh, members of diverse communities feel like they can uh, uh, succeed and they want to excel in that industry. So there is a body of literature out there within uh, a, a variety of strands of academia which is telling us there is a value to having uh, greater diversity in our leadership uh, teams. Now, what we, tr what we then did was, was looked at, well, how is this industry performing? It hasn't really faced the same scrutiny as the other sectors that I mentioned. And so what can we show from sort of an empirical uh, perspective on, on how diverse uh, the leadership in this industry uh, really is? And so in order to do this, um, I spent the summer uh, crawling through uh, thousands of websites of the firms and, and government agencies that make up this industry, and trying to go on the websites and find who are the leaders uh, that, that um, uh, are, are identified uh, of, of the governments, of uh, the, the politicians who run the infrastructure file, and of the private uh, firms. So this is a global uh, data set that has 2,500 people in it, uh, from firms, uh, from hundreds of firms and, and dozens of governments. Uh, governments uh, right across the country uh, and right across the world. 
And what the data shows is that um, for, the, for the senior executives, this is the executive level uh, and the board of directors for organizations that have board of directors, 17% um, are uh, women and 7% are a visible minority uh, in the country that they are working in. Um, so, uh, so you can see that there is a clear uh, diversity gap uh, there. The board of directors tend to be more racially and gender diverse than the senior management teams. Uh, the public sector is more diverse than uh, the private sector. Uh, and you can see that uh, a large swath of companies Ha and, and public agencies have no women or no uh, visible minorities on their uh, board of directors. So there's a large gap there. The Canadian industry, we can ask how does the Canadian industry fit into the global picture? And I would say that on the public sector side, we tend to be exceeding uh, the industry standard globally. Our public sector uh, workforce uh, at the senior levels in, in Canada is more diverse um, uh, racially and uh, uh, gender-wise, but yet on on the, in the private sector, what we're finding is that we are performing below uh, international um, uh, levels. And so the, the private sector, uh, and this is, as you can see, this is a, a broad swath of the private sector, uh, including um, the, co the contractors, the lawyers, the, the, adv the financial advisors, the engineering uh, consultants, um, the, and, the, and the investors. So it's a broad swath of the private sector who were, uh, and the contractors. So it's a broad swath of, of, of this industry. And as a whole, uh, it's not uh, as diverse as in others sectors and, and as, as uh, globally. We also find a clear glass ceiling. Uh, when we talk about the very top position for infrastructure leaders, we are uh, below 10% and often uh, even at, uh, at, 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 at 5%. The chair of the board is very low. And um, one interesting stat is that a woman is more uh, likely to be the prime minister or president of her country than she is to be the minister of infrastructure. There's no explanation for that other than some forms of, uh, of, of discrimination. I mean, how else do we explain? You don't need special expertise to be the Minister of Infrastructure. Um, and so uh, something else is, is uh, going on. It might not be explicit, it may be implicit bias, but there's something about infrastructure that is leading us uh, uh, to, for it to be uh, male, uh, to be male dominated. There are also glass walls, we would call it, by role. Uh, and, and the role, the role type. Uh, so when uh, women in particular are in this industry, they tend to take roles like human resources uh, or the head of strategy and not or, or the head of legal and not necessarily the central role uh, in, in, in decision making like uh, the chief engineer or the, the investment, the key investment manager of, uh, of the senior executive team. So there are uh, glass uh, walls uh, in, in this industry as well. And finally, I think we should recognize the intersection of gender and race, uh, because what we find is that um, uh, you, you can see this sort of diminishing pattern uh, as you start to overlay multiple identities, and that uh, 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 women of color in particular uh, are a very small fraction of this industry, and, uh, and the, numbers, uh, the numbers bear that out, uh, the numbers bear that out globally. And finally, if we want to compare to other industries, other industries that have gained a lot of attention, we might look at companies like uh, Google or Alphabet. So we compared how does the infrastructure industry compare to Google or Alphabet, uh, less diverse and less diverse than the tech sector, which has received a lot more attention in terms of its lack of diversity and the, the causes and impacts than the infrastructure sector uh, has. So I, I think the data is showing that there is uh, a gap here, there is a problem, and uh, I would come back to that saying that we can do better. So I want to turn it over to Adriana now to talk about uh, the lived experience of uh, uh, women in, in, in this industry. Thanks, Manny, for sharing your time with me. Um, hi, everyone. I know what you're thinking. What is a young-ish woman in a hijab doing speaking at a conference like this? Um, it's quite unusual, um, and I'm so pleased to be here. Um, I am a part-time graduate student at U of T under Maddie's tutelage, and I work full-time in construction management at Diamond Schmidt Architects. Uh, my time on the field has really reinforced how uh, disproportionate the male to female ratio is on especially on site and that's what prompted me to kind of join um, Maddie's study. So as part of my culminating uh, report to graduate uh, over the summer I undertook 
28 interviews with women who are currently in senior leadership positions, the point of which was to find out what the common challenges uh, were between them to get to the top. And today I'm here to report on the three most common challenges and to maybe shed some light on what we can do to change that. So the first are opportunities. There's an implicit bias when we make hiring decisions for technical and leadership positions because we're used to what is successful and what works. Um, women and visible minorities have historically been uh, not given the same opportunities and um, back in the day, women, didn't, women and visible minorities didn't have the training, so they couldn't apply for the position, but now it's a matter of not having enough experience or the right experience. And so there's, it's no wonder that there's not many people, not many women or visible minorities at the top because there's barely any of us at the bottom. And we have to make a concerted effort to realize that women and visible minorities uh, haven't had the same opportunities. And um, most importantly, it's not always a welcoming environment for women out on the field to grow their careers in. Uh, from my experience on site, discrimination and racism is still a, an issue. It's very discouraging, but I try not to let it bother me because I do love what I do. The second is confidence. So 100% of the women I spoke to felt that there's this constant pressure to prove themselves over and over and over again. Um, and studies have shown that women are judged more harshly when a negative outcome um, becomes reality. And this type of constant pressure is really debilitating. I know because I have and I'm still living through it. It affects your confidence, which is a key ingredient of leadership, but really confidence can be only developed over time. But if we're not giving uh, women opportunities to um, gain experience, how can their confidence be developed? And it's a, it happens to be a domino effect. So what can be done about it? I'm looking out to leaders uh, in infrastructure right now who hopefully have a fair amount of women working for them, who are as passionate about infrastructure and construction as I am. It might not always be very obvious, but it's there. And I encourage all the leaders to take a few minutes to think about some of the most junior women they have working for them and find a way to encourage them because there's a spark there and we really need to ignite it. It can be as simple as sending an email, and in my case it was. Uh, my boss sent me an email back in April. He said seven words, one of which was my name, so really six. He said, well done, uh, excellent direction. and. I'm still elated when I think about that email because it means that all the hard work, all the long nights, all the sacrifices that I've made, it hasn't gone unnoticed because I've put a lot of time and effort into the project. The third is uh, the question of maternity leave. So once women gain enough experience and confidence um, to really advance in their careers, it's usually around the time that they start to think about having a family if they want one. Um, for the most part, the majority of the industry looks at uh, maternity leave as a uh, hindrance, but it's not uh, unique to infrastructure. It's just magnified in this industry. Um, when it comes to raising children, the majority of the responsibility still falls to women. Um, and in the last few years, even when the incidence of paternity leave has increased, um, it's still not enough for it to be normalized between the two parents. Um, there are some examples of Scandinavian countries where they've mandated paternal leave, and um, not only is it beneficial for the child and the parent, but there, it also removes uh, part of the hiring bias where you have to expect that whether you're male or female that you might go on paternal, on paternal leave. Um, however, we found that uh, through the interviews that the majority of the women did not actually support um, mandating parental leave because it should, at the end of the day, be a choice. Um, but we need to start kind of alleviating the pressure that women feel around this subject. And one of the ways we can do this is to change the words that we associate with parental leave. So instead of asking with, let's, let's start asking it, uh, when. This is especially important in industries slower to change, like the construction industry. Um, it's also important to realize that mothers are probably the best project managers out there. I mean, think about it. What are the qualities of a mother? hardworking, reliable, and incredible multitaskers. So to summarize, uh, what my research has shown is that there aren't a lot of women out in leadership because of the historical and structural issues. 
that are preventing them from getting the right experience. The silver lining here today is that there are support groups such as Women Infrastructures Network that connects women and men together um, for networking and growth opportunities. To forward this movement, um, I'd like to, I'd like the main takeaway from this session to be that you are all in the position to help advance the cause in, of women in infrastructure. Over the last 10 to 15 years, there have been more women entering the industry, but the trouble is promoting and retaining them. So I implore you to offer those, those positions to women that you know who have the same qualifications and to send those emails to your juniors to encourage them so that they, you keep the, the fire alive and to change the words that you use when it comes to mat leave because there are women who are as passionate about infrastructure and construction as I am and I hope that one day I can be sitting alongside you to make those multi-billion dollar decisions for our Canadians. Thank you. So we have, we, we have two questions from the audience on the screen. Um, do you want to handle those from there? Does that, does that work? Yeah. Um, can the audience see them? Or? Uh, no, I think we're going to have to read them. I, I'll read them. Um, with graduation levels from med medical school and law now at parity or even more women, what will it take in engineering and the trades to get to those levels? So. I'll start. I think on this uh, question, um, it's about the culture in the industry, I think. It's about uh, an industry that is still seen as overwhelmingly macho uh, and seen as uh, a space that's dominated by men. And I think there's a large opportunity to, to work to change uh, the culture in this industry. Uh, and that's how we're going to get uh, the best and brightest attracted to engineering. And then when they choose engineering, uh, to not go into the many other sectors of engineering that uh, might be uh, attractive, but to then look at the infrastructure space. So I think there's a lot of uh, room uh, just on, at the culture level uh, before we talk about how we get out uh, and do outreach and, and engagement with uh, young people to attract them to engineering and, uh, and infrastructure. Okay. All right, the next one. Will, will technological advances that disrupt traditional manual labor requirements be an enabler for better gender and racial diversity in the sector? I think so. I think it's, um, it'll definitely help put everyone on the same playing field. Um, and I think with these advances, it's more about um, kind of how you, it's the same kind of knowledge standard that both women and men have equal opportunity to attain. Okay. If there are no others, then we'll move on. With our second presentation, uh, Dr. Tom Murad is the head of Siemens Canada Engineering and Technology Academy, established in October 2014. Tom has more than 35 years of professional engineering and technical operations executive management, including more than 10 years of academic and R&D work in industrial controls and automation. Previous to his current role and beginning in 2010, Tom was head of the expert house and engineering director for Siemens Canada's industry sector. Prior to joining Siemens, Tom was the Senior VP and COO of AZZ Blankhorn and Saw. He previously held various VP and Director positions with numerous international organizations and contributed to many global industrial projects. Tom earned a Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical and, Electronic, Electrical and Electronics and a Doctorate in Power Electronics and Industrial Controls from the Lillboro University of Technology in the UK. He also received a Leadership Program Certificate from Sulich Business School at York University in Ontario. Please join me in welcoming Tom Murad with his presentation, Graduating the Next Generation Talent. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank my, uh, my colleagues to start in a different angle looking at our engineering uh, profession and the gender factor into it, but I'm going to take you into another, into another journey, which is more about the quality of our engineering education. And I, um, 
and I have to probably have to give a disclaimer that this is not the Siemens Canada view. It's Tom Morad's view. So if anybody doesn't like what I say, come to me. Don't go to Siemens and, and complain. Uh, okay. Um, so um, <clears throat> the, uh, I got into this business of education probably by coincidence. Uh, in, in the introduction, Mike talked about uh, being the head of the uh, engineering at the industry sector at Siemens Canada, and, <clears throat> and I really felt the pain because I, was, I had the largest engineering organization within Siemens Canada, and my main challenge and my, the main challenge that my managers went through is hiring newly graduated students from the Canadian universities. And, and I have a passion for giving the chance and hope for new generations, but I always had that block from my colleagues and my managers to say, no, every, every new graduate takes three to five years before he or she becomes productive. And we don't have the time, we don't have the energy, we don't have the passion, and I don't want to use the words about to take care of that new generation guy, so I would rather go and hire somebody from the market and pay another ten, twenty thousand dollars and get away. And I guess uh, for one of my characteristics, I don't give up, so I kept trying to get the new graduates into this. And uh, uh, having a PhD, I have the philosopher part of my mind. I want to go and dig into the root cause of this one. <clears throat> and I was heading the engineering committee at the Siemens Canada at the time three years ago. And we found out that th those concerns are really uh, uh, valuable, they have merits, and we have to find a solution. So with Siemens Canada, we had our own solution, but I want to tell you what is the status of our, this is what, what's my finding about in our engineering education. And I say that with all due respect to our, our engineering universities, they are considered as the top universities or, or one of the top universities in the, in the world, comparatively speaking, but we are not talking about the quantitative part, we are, talk, uh, uh, we are talking about the qualitative part. But it's, uh, it's not only the university issue, it's, the, it's, a, it's a whole society issue. If you look at, if, and, and I want to start by linking our education system with our job market, because that's why we are here today. We are the private sector and the public sector, we have an issue with the resources, and I want to tell you how our system is, quote, unquote, lazy-eyed when we look about preparing our resources for the future. And the, uh, we, we all listened to, um, uh, to Mr. Ismail ta telling us about how exponentially the technology is, is moving and how our universities are still uh, teaching uh, in the past. And the, uh, if, we look, if we compare what we need in the market, and, and, and how our universities are graduating our students, it's like a pyramid. And the bottom of the pyramid starts with the, with the trend, trades people. And the top of the pyramid is our PhDs and the master's degree. And the jobs that are related with the, with the bottom of the pyramids are actually the largest quantity of, of, our, of our kids, if I may say so, that we have to prepare for our, for our market. And if we just start take, uh, and, and the relation is not linear, it's more logarithmic, so roughly for every technician, for every 100 technician, we need one technologist, for every 100 technologists, we need one engineer, for every uh, uh, 100 engineers, we need one master, for every 100 masters, we need one doctorate. I'm just giving roughly numbers. The reality is completely different. The reality in the engineering, I'll just walk through, these are not my numbers, these are Engineers Canada numbers. If you get to the enrollment of engineering, according to Engineers Canada, since 19, from 1990 to 2015, the number of our students grew up by 54% growth. And that is part of the bigger cake, which is every year in, uh, we have about 650,000 students go to universities. 85,000 of them go to engineering discipline in different universities all over Canada. And that, is, that makes about, if you add to them the international students who are another 15K, so we are talking about 100,000 students go to this, to this process every year. And uh, <clears throat> in, with those 100,000, comparatively, we have every year 15,000 students enroll for master's degree and 10,000 students enroll for, for PhD degrees. For a nation of 33 million people, do we need to have 
that number of PhDs. And now we are going to find out why are we going through this, because that's the quality of our education system. So um, according to, to the uh, Organization for Economic Co Cooperative Development, there are studies on the countries with the most doctoral graduates in science and, and engineering. Canada comes on the top five countries in the world. And the numbers of, of PhDs uh, in the population with 0.01% compared to the top, top country, which is the UK. And I'm just going running through this, and there's lots of facts that doesn't make sense. Okay? While we are bringing carpenters every day and making exceptions to our, to our immigration law for people, for electricians and mechanics and carpenters and, and, and make a lot of exceptions every year. But we are graduating all these PhDs and masters. UK graduate 0.15 per capita every year. But, but that doesn't, those numbers doesn't jive with how much we, we spend for R&D. Because R&D is our, our most point of focus. We are focusing more on R&D, but the job market, I'm talking in the eyes of the universities of our post-secondary education system. The undergraduates are, are not in the equation. Everybody measures our innovation and capturing with technology is by how many, how many numbers of PhDs and masters we graduate every year. And again, I can't repeat this more and more than the job market doesn't need that number of, we need more educated engineers, more educated technologists, and more educated. When I talk about educated, most of you know it's about the breadth of knowledge that we give them, what is the amount, of, what is the dis number of disciplines, and the spectrum of knowledge that we give, and how in-depth we teach them. And both of those dimensions are an MS. So, the uh, Canada it, it, uh, spends about 1.615 of our gross domestic spending on R&D. That's about $25 billion a year for, for uh, research. And uh, the world average is about 2.23. But the, the unique part of Canada is we spend 50% of this time on the higher education, while other countries, the world average about 19% goes to the higher education. And I'm just paving a road for you to come to the real story that I'm going. With all these expenditures of our tax money and of our national wealth, we are going into spending three times what the world average of spending on the higher education for research and our, at the same time, our global innovation index is going down. 2013, we were number 11. We ranked 11 in the world. In 2016, we are ranking 16, country 16th in the world. When I looked further about the graduation, the funny part is I couldn't find information about how, what is the percentage from, from, from a, a, a legitimate uh, reported uh, uh, what you call a jurisdiction. But roughly, everybody tells me roughly it's about 70 to 80 percent and of our students who go to engineering. There's lots of dropout. Lots of them go to, an, to other programs of, uh, rather than engineering and uh, nobody, nobody track where are they going. But we have every year going through the tunnel 100,000 uh, 100, engineer, uh, engineers to be in the system. I looked other, at another set of, a set of um, statistics from um, our national uh, Statistic Canada 2011. The, the shocking part is only 30% of our graduates from engineering all over Canada, only 30% of them gets a job in engineering. There is another 35% that gets other jobs that requires uh, university degrees, but not engineering. And there is another 35% are doing other jobs that doesn't even require university degrees. That's the shocking information. If we compare, and, and these are the, uh, the uh, uh, percentages for Ontario 
and other jurisdictions in Canada are not very much different. Alberta is the highest, which is around 40. But bear in mind, 80% of the, our engineering students, they go to, uh, to universities in Ontario and, and Quebec. If you compare these results with other professions, with the medicine and the law and teachers and nursing, the closest to them is 60% working in their profession. So if we look at our return of investment, what are we doing with our, with our, I'm not talking only about the money that we are spending in the engineering education, I'm talking what are we doing for our new generation? And why are we getting all these numbers? So Ontario Society of Professional Engineers have a report on this one and it's what published, and they're talking about uh, the root causes, potential root causes of why we are having these low numbers. Some of them are saying there is excess supply of engineers entering the labor market, but we are talking about, if the numbers are right, about 70,000 graduates a year from all engineering that are feeding all these projects. We have 1,500 people in this, in this event today representing multiple infrastructure that needs engineering. So 70,000 a year to be absorbed by the market is not a large number of engineers. There are other side, there is, there is not sufficient jobs, uh, engineering jobs being created by the economy which doesn't have lots of uh, factors. The other one is society or parents are pushing their kids to go and study engineering uh, without knowing that there is no jobs. Again, that is not. But there's two major ones that click my mind. Number one is employers are demanding specialized knowledge and skills before they will hire an engineer to avoid the cost and time required with an on-job training. And universities are graduating engineers with in insufficient job-related skills to successfully compete for the available engineering jobs. These are the two main factors that why we cannot hire our own graduates. And thanks God for the immigrants who are coming to this country that are taking some of those, some of those available jobs and keeping our industry and economy moving. And I'm sad for our generations that, that are getting through all this, uh, 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 investing their lives and their money and their parents' money into getting to the system, and they end up going into the only avenue for them is to go and do postgraduate studies because our education system pushed them towards that. And look at our education system. It's actually recycling our students to do masters and PhD because they don't have the sufficient skills to go to the market, and the industry is demanding and they are not willing to invest in that, okay? So we are all guilty. The universities are not graduating the right quality we have. The industry is becoming cheaper. They are not spending on the new guys like the old days where, where we were hiring the people and, 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 and training them and spending money on them. And the government, although they are, they are spending money, but the money is not, is not quantitatively measured. And I can give you an example as the, 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 the I, I can't claim that I have the, the, the answer to this, but we at Siemens Canada, what we did, we had our own, uh, and I, this is not a sales pitch that I'm trying to do, but we said, we, let's do something and let's have everybody else do it. And then we went into our Siemens Academy that I have the privilege to be heading, and we are bringing students two years before they graduate from, uh, from university and call them to the industry and uh, <clears throat> they come twice for four month sessions each, and we give them one of the four months we give them classroom training, okay? Uh, because everybody, when we talk about experiential training, we talk about the co op system, the old fashioned 19th century co op system where we are doing doping of our students in the, in the industry. They learn whatever they have to learn, and then it's, it's practically cheap labor, okay? And these kids, they think that they are learning something, but they are not and the, the managers who are taking them, they are not giving them the right time and the right thing. So when, with Siemens, what we did is, is, is managed and controlled, and we had four months of shadowing and mentoring within our own Siemens divisions, and four months we are giving them classroom boot camp, where we teach them soft skills, business skills, legal skills, everything that they need to be successful, and we are teaching them, most importantly, what the engineering schools are not teaching them not the concepts and the fundamentals and the equations and the curves. 
We are teaching them real engineering, system engineering. What are they going to be seeing in the mining field and what are they going to be seeing in the oil and gas and what are they going to see if they work on a train and what are they going to be seeing. And, and this is in our area where we do electrification and automation and, and digitalization. So we believe that the work integrated learning is the best way for our students. We approach the universities to include the technologies that Mr. Ismail is talking about and what Siemens and other companies are using. But the universities have a, have a god called the curriculum. And they don't want to change their god. And that curriculum, is nobody can touch it. And if you want to change it, it takes three years to be changed, if any. And our students are, I went to, to school in engineering 40 years ago. And I go to the classroom now and I see the same, the same topics and no, are not even taught in the same way because the professors who are teaching, they have never been in the field. And I challenge my colleagues who are in the university, and I used to be a professor 25 years ago, but I worked in the industry, and I know what a switchgear is, and I know what a, what a control system is. But we are, when I say recycling, we are having our students graduating, taking masters and PhD and postdoctorate, and they come back and teach the new one without even being in the field. This is engineering. Engineering is not science. It's applied science. And if we need to graduate engineers, the universities have to wake up and to talk to the industries and to, to, to be acceptable to change the curriculum. Otherwise, we are not going to be a competitive country in the industry. Again, I'm referring to the, the room there. And we go into that. I'm going to tell you what the rate for accepting the students for my academy from the top universities in, in Ontario. For every 22 student that I interview, I choose one. And that is not for them to be perfect. That's that they are acceptable to learn new technologies. Isn't that sad? I'm a parent, and I know what I'm talking about. So the other problem is, which is our non-profit for profit organizations that are taking this, because they're going after the, the government funds and, and trying to make out of it. The, this, they are taking the work integrated learning programs now, and again, in a qualitative saying. After three years that we have been talking to the government about how it's going to be to everybody say, yeah, the Siemens one is the Mercedes of the world, is the Cadillac of the world, but nobody want to do the same thing. The, and the, we end up with a government funding $5,000 a year per student. And it doesn't say if that student goes to academy or goes to a, to a co-op or goes to spend time in, in, um, in a working place. So how many other years do we have to spend and to waste? And we are seeing every year 70,000 of our sons and daughters are graduating and they cannot find a job. And they end up working in a Best Buy, and that's one of the best case scenarios. And we are having a problem now. I sit on the licensing committee for BEO to license engineers after four years. We have growing numbers of graduating engineers who cannot be professional engineers because they didn't have the opportunity to practice engineering. So we need, this is a, this is a society movement. This is not a decision by the government or decision by the industry. I'm talking here not promoting Siemens or bashing anybody. I'm saying that if we continue like this, neither the industry is going to be happy, nor the students are going to be happy, nor the taxpayers are going to be happy. But the money is spent. What is our return of investment? Thank you very much. Do I have time for questions? Or? So question one, I feel like, I feel there is an unconscious bias against PhD graduates in the industry. Will there be a shift in the future? Okay, well, I have a PhD, there's nothing wrong about me, and I have, <laughs> the problem is we are in a capitalist economy, and I have to be here. We are in a capitalist economy. People in the industry, they, they want to use somebody to do the job. They don't care what degrees do you have. And I suffered from that when I came to this country 25 years ago. I tell them, I'm, I'm a PhD, I was doing something, can you do the job? And they want to pay you, that's the problem that's about industry, they're cheapos, they want to pay less. The pro that's the other culture they didn't have time. When you graduate with a PhD, your expectations are high. 
So there is, there is, there is no unconscious bias. It's, it's the reality. It's the, it's, the, it's the nature of our economy. And that's what I'm saying. For an economy like Canada, we don't need to graduate those numbers of postgraduate students. And we have to have an education system and a culture that tells the people if you don't do a PhD, it's not wrong. What's wrong is when you, don't, when you cannot find a job at home. That's where our problem is. You know, other countries like the U.S., they don't spend all this money for the PhDs. They make exceptions to their immigration law, and they absorb all the PhDs from all over the world. We are graduating our PhDs, and there is no jobs in, at home, and then we are pushing them to go and work for the U.S. What sort of investment we are doing? That's the question we are talking about. There's no bias. Nobody discriminates against me yet. How would Why you not? do that? Yeah, in the interest of time. Yeah, yeah. We okay, we'll leave this afterwards. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, you know, Tom, I used to do a, a significant amount of recruiting for the firm. Um, and I tell you, this, this is not just an issue in Canada. This is, this is an issue in the U.S. too. It's spot on. This is, this is um, an area where we, we uh, have a, a significant amount of consternation ourselves. It's, it's, there's no practical education standard curricula within the engineering schools in, in the U.S. either, and it's a problem. Uh, our last presenter is Michael Finn. He will give us our last presentation today, Maximizing the Value of Innovation. Michael Finn is a senior advisor at Strategy Corp. Prior to his position with Strategy Corp, Michael was an Ontario Deputy Minister under three premiers. He was a municipal, municipal chief administrator in Hamilton and Burlington and the founding CEO of both Metrolinx and Mississauga Halton Local Health Integration Network. He now writes and consults on municipal and infrastructure issues. A certified board director, he serves on the boards of the $85 billion Omers AC Pension Fund and the Toronto Lands Corporation, which is Toronto Board of Education's realty arm. His municipal management career was recently profiled with a chapter in the book, Leaders in the Shadows, The Leadership Qualities of Municipal Chief Administrative Officers, written by Professor David Siegel. Michael's latest research report, looking at Ontario's infrastructure planning, priority setting, and improving AFP, was published in September by the Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario. Join me in welcoming Michael Finn. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you to you for... Uh, uh, sticking with it, and we're working through to the uh, last presentation. I trust uh, at least uh, that uh, you all, you're uh, going to learn something um, from all three uh, sets of presentations, because I think uh, the quality is, uh, of those who went before me certainly uh, are, argues for uh, your endurance. So, um, the, uh, we've established that there is an infrastructure gap, and I think the CC, uh, Triple P and uh, RCCAO and other organizations have gone, done a good job of, of making that case. We have a $130 billion from Ontario committed. Uh, uh, we have $160 billion plus an infrastructure bank from the federal government. We heard about the trillion dollar U.S. Uh, uh, plan and uh, we see things like USA Today, uh, Brian Bechtel from Bechtel Construction saying that uh, Infrastructure Ontario's model is one that the United States should follow. But 60% uh, of our infrastructure is in the hands of local governments and other local authorities, and municipalities are planning to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on bridges and uh, schools and waterworks and things of that kind. Uh, so are, are they going to use uh, P3 uh, models uh, in going forward, or is it going to be limited to the few very large transit projects and a couple of the projects that won awards here today? Uh, part of the problem is the sticker shock. Uh, there's a concern that the costs of uh, major infrastructure projects, whether P3 or otherwise, are very large. But as we've learned, uh, those may look like big figures to us, but yesterday's investments in infrastructure seem like good value for the money and a wise investment. Uh, so, and the other thing is that the infrastructure gap is not just about money. We really have an innovation gap, but the innovation gap also presents the opportunity for us going forward. Uh, we've seen a lot of financial innovation, particularly in the uh, alternative financing and procurement model that uh, Infrastructure Ontario uses, but there's all kinds of innovation that we should be seeing and, and we are seeing and we should see a lot more of. Innovation in design, construction, technology, funding, uh, operation and refurbishment. Uh, so I, I guess the message is that wise infrastructure investment serves us for a generation, 
but importantly, poor infrastructure decisions will burden us for decades, and we can all think of some examples. And the way in which we avoid that is we, we have to recognize that without good planning and without good project selection, without more practical EA processes, without well-structured P3s, uh, with a mo without a competitive P3 marketplace, and without a focus particularly on future needs and megatrends, which we saw a uh, uh, dollop of at lunch today, uh, projects are going to continue to be delayed, money is going to continue to be wasted, and ultimately the taxpayer support for this kind of an initiative is going to melt away. The evidence says, after uh, now three decades in the business, that P3s are good insurance. The, the, we may be entering a golden age in infrastructure, as we saw in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. But I think it depends on courage and forward thinking, and above all, on innovation. The innovation agenda is important. Uh, the research su suggests that we could uh, save between 5 and even up to 20 percent using the P3 model if we are uh, prudent about the way in which we uh, structure them and if we are innovative in the way that we deliver them. So with that little sermonette, I'm going to uh, uh, give you a, a presentation that you should be able to see from the back of the room if you're inclined to, and it'll give you the seven measures that I think through the research that I've done uh, over the last year that uh, are things that we might do to uh, stay ahead of the game for the next quarter century. First of all, it's important for us to be holistic in the approach and integrated in the infrastructure plans that we develop. Uh, we need to be more, uh, have infrastructure planning that's more evidence-based, more using, uh, more uh, uh, frequently using a business case, for, particularly for project selection. And we need to recognize that uh, when we choose, for example, a rapid transit project, it's not just about transportation. It's about community building. It's about, could even be about aesthetics. And we need to recognize that, that that kind of a holistic approach is necessary. And we need to be much more methodical in the way in which we make those selections. Secondly, we need to identify ways to lower costs. Uh, P3s, one of the critiques has historically been that they're expensive to, to uh, in terms of the uh, pursuit costs, the uh, process costs, and the ongoing uh, operation. We need to it needs to continue to represent a good premium for the insurance that you buy when you take on a P3 project. As we get better and as we incorporate more P3 techniques, even into traditional procurement, we should be able to uh, get the model down and lower the costs and make it more attractive to people uh, as we approach it. Uh, the model we have, for example, using uh, in social infrastructure in hospitals should be refining itself to the point where we are benefiting from the uh, experience that we've had. Uh, third area is in building Canadian capacity. We need to have uh, designed procurement in a way that builds domest the domestic P3 industry, and that, uh, that, uh, that will allow us to continue to be leaders into the, into the next quarter century. But that means introducing new players, both foreign and domestic. It means ensuring the steady pipeline of projects, as we've heard about before, and it means pursuing and demonstrating innovation. And we see lots of examples of this, but we need to really leverage them and build upon them. Third, we need to transfer the right risks. Uh, there's a tendency, and I come from the municipal sector originally, to try and load as much onto the, onto the bidders as, as is possible. And in some cases, uh, that isn't the right risk, and they're not in the best position to manage that risk. I think we need to uh, encourage more competition and lower co tax, cost to taxpayers. And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that the right risk is applied to the right party. The experience of some uh, recent municipal projects might give us some ideas on what kinds of risks belong with the private sector and what kinds of risks belong with the public sector. I think we need to expand, fifth of all, uh, into local government and to mid-sized firms. If 60% of the infrastructure is in, in local hands and if many local firms have the potential but not the opportunity to participate, we need to do something about that. We need to design a model that invites wider participation uh, by the local government sector, and that comes from simple things like standardizing documents and standardizing the terms and conditions of, of uh, deal structures and things of that kind. The work that the CCPPP has done on bundling, I think, is really important. In, Miss in Missouri and Pennsylvania, they've demonstrated that big bang type approaches to uh, collecting similar generic type work in, in things like uh, uh, bridge building has done a world of, uh, made a world of difference in their transportation infrastructure. We've done the same in some, some parts of Canada with school infrastructure or with uh, OPP detachments here in Ontario. We could do more of that kind of thing, and we need to uh, spend some time to make sure we can get that right. Uh, the sixth thing, I think, is we need to keep track of our costs. We need to make them transparent. 
Uh, Maddie's done a lot of good work to talk about the kinds of things the infrastructure bank should be doing and the kinds of things that others can probably do better. And one of the things that I think is an important area is to document the delivered costs of what we do with the projects, both P3 and traditional. I saw a list uh, the other day of 72 traditionally pro uh, procured projects that had been over budget or over time. And uh, I think we can do more to use that information to push down the costs, both on P3s and on, on traditional projects. Um, and we've got lots of experience, but uh, I think it's important that we have a neutral uh, third party that analyzes and uses good data and ensures that the kind of information that we have available is, is going to be working to the advantage both of the bidders and of the taxpayers. And finally, and all, above all, we need to support innovative solutions. If we're going to have the Canadian P3 industry stay on top, we need to demonstrate innovation. And we need to see it in all aspects of infrastructure. I listed some of the areas that we uh, should be continuing to see infrastructure in, in innovation. It began life as a, as a financial model, and the innovation there was important, but I think there are a whole lot of other areas where we could make, make up considerable ground, and there's a lot of experience both internationally and domestically that could be brought to bear on that. Um, I think if we do, uh, the research suggests, but as I said, between 5 and 20 percent innovation savings are possible, and that's not just being parsimonious or shrinking the size of operating rooms. It's, it's general, genuine uh, creative uh, application of technology and design and, and ongoing maintenance uh, uh, systems to make sure that we can uh, benefit from that. But th that would translate, in given the, the figure we were just talking about, probably in the order of $200 billion in Ontario alone, uh, a 5 to 20 percent savings, even a 10 percent savings, means a whole lot more infrastructure is going to be built and a whole lot more taxpayer support is going to be generated. Uh, I, this um, summary comes out of a report that I prepared after interviewing about two dozen uh, leading people in the industry, government and private, uh, as well as in, in the academic community and looking at some of the research in the field, and I'd encourage you to have a look at that if uh, anything I've said uh, looks of interest to you. And uh, with that, I think I'll turn it back to our moderator to follow up. Thank you. So with that, I believe we are complete with our presentations. We have no submitted questions, but uh, if there are any in the audience, we actually have a minute. We're, we, we're going for an hour, and that's, that's about what we hit. So um, if there are none, then I want to thank the panel uh, for uh, these excellent presentations. Appreciate your time here. And um, oh wait, we have time for one more question. I'll read it here. Adriana, do you feel there's a lack in feedback given to women? Does do unconscious bias, does unconscious bias play a role on site? Um, this is a really good question. I think definitely there is a lack of feedback given to women. Um, also, um, lack of kind of support. Um, I know I've been very lucky in that my firm has been very supportive in me taking on this role. Um, and. Just to come back to the site question, it was an earlier question tied to the engineering and trades and how to get more women involved. Um, when you look at even just the uniform for, for, for what trades do, it's not, um, it's not designed for women. So when you see that, it, you, you don't really feel encouraged to, to go into it. So for example, um, I've dealt a lot with asbestos. And if you look at an asbestos uniform, or um, it's the same problem with mining. Um, it's a one suit kind of thing, and if you're, um, abating an area, it's, you have to you know, drink lots of water, keep hydrated because you're in a very confined space. But what happens when you drink a lot of water, you have to use the washroom. So as a woman, if you wanted to get into abatement, um, you, it, it would be very difficult because if you're on site um, and you're abating an area, you would have to use the washroom like five, ten times a day and it would take you like half your shift to get out of your uniform um, and then you would have to go back. So I think that Little things like that really affect how we see and how we get attracted to different fields. Um, and definitely, um, I think more feedback and more support would be really helpful. Tom, do you want one? Yeah. Uh, 
have this on? Or? I said, so do you believe the, the exceptional expectation of fast career building of today's graduates may be related to their unwillingness slash inability to learn how to be job ready? Yeah, I, I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. Our new generation are, in general, very smart. But what I was talking about, instead of them being book smart, where our education system is growing them to, to be job smart, because that's where they are heading. And from what we are seeing, there is that it's not unwillingness or inability, because I've, I've had three cohorts of university students in my academy, and I got top results from them. All what they need is guidance by people who has been in the industry and who know what they are talking about. And the, I'm not, again, demoting our education system requirement. This is like a big dough, but you cannot in, enjoy the cake dough without the icing and the cherry and the everything on top of it, whatever you like. The industry want a full meal that is, they want them ready to be doing this. And this is what we want them, what we want them to be. Is the generation smart? Yes, they are smart, but they need our guidance. They need our support, they need uh, our training, and they need our investment. And, and there's, they are willing to do whatever you want them to do as long as you give them the right guidance and give them the right jobs. Great. Uh, okay, question in the audience. You can use the, the microphone if you'd like or project. Hi there, I submitted my question in the app and I guess it didn't show up. Just a question um, regarding your research. Did you find uh, examples in the Canadian infrastructure sector where there was good representation of women and people of color? And, and do you know what they might have done differently to achieve that? Um, so this is a topic for uh, ongoing research. Uh, I would say the, the Canadian public sector uh, is, is performing better than its, its counterparts. Uh, and we're seeing in the leadership roles of some of the major PPP organizations, for example, uh, women have taken a significant role on the board of directors, in some cases as the chair, uh, and also as uh, leaders uh, and CEOs, um, uh, like at Partnerships BC. So I would say the Canadian uh, public sector, also the Canadian pension funds, uh, are, are exceeding uh, their international counterparts in the investment community. Uh, but I think there's still such a long way to go. I mean, in Canada, we're, uh, even in the public sector, it, the percentage of uh, women is probably at around 25%, uh, or 20, between 20 and 25%, and uh, visible minorities is, is far lower. So I think there's really a ways to go, and I think uh, articulating and having these uh, conversations is gonna be the first place to start. Okay, with that, Join me in, uh, in thanking our panel.